Security Risk by Ed M. Clinton, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Security Risk by Ed M. Clinton, Jr. At moments like this, General David Walker always thought fleetingly of the good old days when he had hated the army. As usual, he smashed the thought out of his mind with a distinct sense of remorse. He looked up again at the seamed face of the Chief of Staff, General Marcus Merriweather. This could be serious, he said slowly, with a sick sense of the statement's inadequacy. An old tick suddenly returned tugging at the left corner of his mouth. The deadly, unsmiling expression on Merriweather's face did not change as he slid more tightly into his chair. "'You know as well as I that it means the Interplanetary Confederation is ready to go to war with us.' Walker stared at the typed statement on his desk. It was a decoded intelligence message from United Terra's prime agent in the Interplanetary Confederation and it was very brief. The Confederation had developed a long-range neural weapon, effectively cancelling out every armament development achieved by United Terra in fifteen years of Cold War, that of late had become bitter cold. The all but autonomous colonies of March and Venus, united now for twenty years in an economic league, had been itching for independence for a quarter of a century the each had developed into a mighty burning you are fully aware meriwether continued his face still set of our feeling that the confederation has been eager to take on terra they've clearly been waiting for some positive advantage to offset our pure strength in numbers it was a touchable touching and untouchable both scientist and general were doing their own version of right Walker forced his eyes upward and stared at his superior. "'Your tone says that such a war might be unwelcome at this time, unwelcome at this time.' Merriweather shifted around in his chair and scratched at his leather arms with the manicured tips of his gnarled fingers. "'Walker, I don't have to tell you that this weapon, if it is what our agents infers, and there is no reason to believe otherwise, that this weapon makes it impossible for us to go to war with the Confederation, unless, as Chief of Weapons Development, you can tell me that we have something in our arsenal to combat it. Walker rubbed at the tick. Nothing, he said quietly. Merriweather leaned forward, his hands crooked backward against the chair arms like catapult springs. That answer is unacceptable. There are other questions you must answer, Walker, questions in some ways even more important than that basic one. Why haven't we developed this weapon ourselves? Why haven't we been aware of its potential existence? Where are the defensive devices which would naturally develop from such cognizance? These things are all your department, Walker. His voice pitched upward an hysterical fraction. It just doesn't make sense, you know. We've a hundred times the personnel, ten times the facilities, unlimited funds, but they've beaten us to it. He stood up and pushed his chair back, eyes squinting out of a reddening face that seemed on the point of bursting. Why, Walker? Once again Walker thought about how he had hated the army when he was a bright young physics student. That was a long time ago. So much had happened. The doors had closed around him one at a time, doors closing on the scientific mind. And so now, instead of a research scientist in white smock with textbook, he was a military administrator in smart grace with glittering stars of military rank. "'I'll say this, Walker,' Merriweather shouted, his voice breaking again. "'We'd better catch up quick, mighty quick. Let's put it this way. It might mean your rank and your job, Walker, but you won't give a damn, because we'll have lost the war. We'll have lost the colonies. 
and you know what that would mean walker he bent forward across the desk his face exploding into walker's eyes only a fool believes that united terra can survive in an economy without triplanetary hegemony walker you've all the authority within my power to grant you will have no trouble getting money but get the answer quick walker blinked after him as he strode to the door i'll try to hold off a federal investigation as long as i can meriwether added turning from the half-open door but i can't guarantee a thing walker sat alone in a cubicle of light in the darkened city and gulped down his twentieth cup of coffee it had grown cold in the cup and with a grimace he pushed it aside there was no doubt about it he thumbed through the sheaf of scribbled notes he had transcribed from stacks of documents and racks of spools from security files clearly he had the answer to meriwether's questions but having it he did not quite know what to do with it there was however no doubt at all united terra had been on the track of the neural weapon ten years earlier could have had it and had lost the chance he rubbed his thumbs hard against his tired eyes and tried to remember back that ten years at that time he had been chief of weapons development for perhaps three years his own name though had appeared in none of the files he had examined so apparently he had not been directly involved in the security hearings but he should remember dr otto millet otto millet he let the name roll around his brain until shortly an image began to form an image of a smiling man graying at the temples wearing a flamboyant sports shirt and affecting a very close haircut a man perhaps forty in the image he was a laughing man he remembered now dr otto millet into government service on the inertia of a fantastic reputation as a research physicist specializing in magnetic field studies a man he had instantly disliked he bent forward and reared what he had scrawled in his last notes a verbatim extract from the report of the security committee it is clear that dr millet's conversations and letters with professor grayman together with his unrepentant attitude render him a security risk his various security clearances are therefore revoked and he is hereafter prohibited access to all classified files and to any government research and development laboratory since virtually all laboratories were government supported that was to all intents and purposes the end of millet's career as an experimental physicist where had millet gone what had he done since walker scraped a cigarette out of the half-empty pack in his pocket more important what was he doing now he inhaled deeply and sent clouds of smoke skewing across the room had the man really been a traitor walker tried to place himself in the time of millet's hearing he'd been not too many years out of school then with the bitterness of his frustrated ambition to be a research physicist still rankling him perhaps this had colored his view of millet he stared at his desk almost shocked that this thought should have occurred to him it shook him for it told him something about himself which he did not particularly care to know nowhere had he been able to find any evidence as to what had happened to millet since banished the government seemed to forget him but one thing was clear to walker and he pondered it deeply as he sucked on the last quarter inch of his cigarette and poured himself another cup of cold black coffee one big thing millet had been directing development along lines that would have led to the neural weapon he had even signed a report early in his project effort which had referred to the possibility of a neural device had he gone over to the confederation it would account for their possession of the weapon now but surely surely this fact would have been observed and reported by terran intelligence agents 
Walker, infinitely tired, forgot his coffee and began to tidy up the desk, filing everything he wanted to keep in an electronically locked cabinet, shoving everything else into the destruction of the vibrator. He pondered for a moment the powder secrets that were heaped like black dust in the bottom of the canister, a symbol of safety to a terrified world. Step one. Find Millet. Find Millet. It took Secret Service exactly twenty-nine hours to locate Dr. Otto Millet. Thirty minutes later, Walker was climbing out of a government helicopter and staring at Millet's small house through squinted eyes, which he shielded with both hands against the blazing desert sun. The house was fronted by a neat lawn and a white fence entwined with red roses, there appeared to be a rather large garden in the rear. The style of the house bothered him a little. It had passed out of popularity thirty years before. Its lack of a conventional roof port had forced them to land the copter on the desert itself. He straightened and pushed through the creaking gate. Flagstone steps curved towards the porch, and he minced along them, uncertain now that he had arrived, of what he would say to Millet. The damned house, he thought, so different from what he had expected, it had thrown his whole thinking out of order. He hated himself for feeling uneasy. There was neither border nor contact system of any kind at the door, and he brushed his hand against his forehead in a gesture of frustration. He stared at his palm. It had come away wet with sweet and he wondered if it were all because of the desert sun. Tentatively he banged on the door with his fist. There was no answer. Damn Millet, he thought, wiping his forehead again. Why couldn't the man have a video phone like any normal person, so you could find out if he were home without taking a trip halfway across the country? He turned, stamping angrily as he did so and was startled to see a man, wearing work clothes and holding a pair of heavy-soiled gloves in his left hand, standing on the ground by the end of the porch. He was nearly bald, intensely bronzed, and he was smiling. "'Wondered when you'd see me,' he nodded toward the gate. "'I was standing right there when you came up. You just breezed right past.' He smiled broadened. You were so interested in being surprised that you couldn't see what you came for. It must have been that damned glare, muttered Walker, shaking his head. Then, impolitely, are you Millet? Otto Millet, the other replied, inclining his head slightly. You're from the government. I can tell because of the uniform, you see. Walker flushed. The government hasn't thought about me in a number of years the scientist added he came up onto the porch and peered at the symbol on the left lapel of walker's jacket ah alma mater weapons development he squinted at walker david walker i presume he chuckled loudly but walker failed to see the humor i remember you you see what a shame you can't return the compliment it's hot out here complained walker in growing discomfort millet opened the door won't you come in it's better inside there it was again thought walker the insolence the imperturbable smile he grunted and went in it was mercifully considerably cooler he looked around it was a very cluttered living room, not messy, but tossed about with the artifacts that the man obviously liked to have around him. There was an ancient painting by Bonestell hanging on one wall, a startlingly accurate twentieth-century concept of the appearance of Mars, several long pipe racks filled to overflowing in various spots around the room, a typewriter on a table in a corner, and piles of paper books lining the walls and stacked on the floor in heaps and on the table beside the typewriter a map of the earth on the wall above the typewriter a three-dimensional waterson projection the furniture was clean but not old 
lived with. Walker went over to the wall map and peered closely. One of Waterson's first, remarked Millet, closing the door. Sit down, Walker, and tell me all about weapons development. How is the mass murder department doing these days? Walker felt his ears redden, and he was arrested in the very act of sitting down. Really, he said. It is not something we like to think about, you know. Suppose not. Millet fiddled with several pipes in a rack beside his chair, selected one, and began filling it with a rough-cut tobacco from a battered canister. To business, then. Why the visit? Walker cleared his throat and tried to remember the little prefatory weasel words he had painfully assembled during the flight from Omaha. First of all, Dr. Millet, I find myself a little embarrassed. After all, your parting from the government service was not of the happiest nature for you. Don't be foolish. Happiest day of my life, Walker. Walker had a sudden sense of being impaled, and the rest of the little speech was dissipated in the wave of shock which swept over him. He forced his mouth shut and gaped. You're not serious. Millet shook out his second match and puffed until the pipe bowl glowed warmly, edge to edge. "'Of course I am serious,' he jabbed his pipe at Walker. "'You like your job?' "'It's a job that has to be done.' Millet smiled and shrugged. "'You haven't really answered my question.' Walker, sensing that he had already lost control of the conversation, waved his hands in dismissal. Well, that is not really important. The fact remains you did leave weapons development at the, um, request of the government. Talk on, talk on. You'll get to the point eventually. When you're through, I'd like to show you around the place. I'm very proud of my gardens. You're sort of responsible for them, you know. Walker said his jaw and bored ahead. However, at the time you left government service, you were pursuing certain lines of research. Millet leaned back and began laughing, his eyes squinted shut. Walker, don't tell me they want me back. It seemed his chance to dominate the discussion again. I don't think you'd be allowed back. Good, said Millet, looking up, his laughter fading into a smile. I was a bit concerned for a moment. There was silence in the room. Walker began to wish that he were somewhere else. Millet simply baffled him. He obviously did not care about his disgrace. Walker felt a resurgence of the old resentment. Millet's face suddenly became very kindly. Perhaps as a fellow scientist? Walker almost winced and knew furiously that his response had shown you would be interested in knowing what I've been doing since my unhappy marriage with the bureaucracy ended. It was a welcome gambit, and Walker accepted it eagerly. I certainly would. One of the reasons I came here, as a matter of fact, Millet waved his pipe. Good. Afterwards you can stop beating around the bush, eh? Yes, of course, mumbled Walker. You know said millet as he got up and went to a bookcase a man's got to earn a living do much reading not these days used to he scratched a cigarette on the sole of his shoe and inhaled hugely not enough time these days for reading millet reached into the bookcase and came out with a stack of magazines well that's how i make my living he handed the stack to walker writing use a pen name of course he chuckled write everything always happy doing science fiction though walker flipped through the magazines he looked up obviously you're doing rather well at it i've been for the last seven or eight years lot of fun and this has been your life since you left us walker set the stack of magazines aside seems a waste of genius somehow as a matter of fact, this is not my life's work. As I said, a man's got to earn a living. This is just a lucrative hobby that pays the way. You see, I've been involved in an expensive research program. Ah, 
Walker sat forward and smashed out his cigarette. This may be important. Oh, it is, it is. But not, I am afraid, in the way you mean. You can never tell. What have you been doing? Completing a unified theory of life. Why a crystal grows but isn't alive? Why an organism that dies isn't like a crystal? What is the process we call life? what is its relationship to the space-time continuum he said it so casually that walker was caught off his guard completely are you serious millet he said certainly i expect to publish in about two years is this an independent effort not entirely others have contributed some pioneers long dead some among the living his eyes twinkled you see important things beside the development of weapons of destruction do continue in the scientific world did you think that was the end of everything for me ten years ago he shook his head in mock gravity it was just the beginning i wanted out you see you wanted out walker leaned forward unwilling to believe what he had heard are you trying to tell me that you arranged your discharge millet shrugged why of course nobody ever has bothered to ask me about that up to now but i certainly did arrange it it wasn't hard you know all i had to do was set up some sort of relationship with a so-called security risk and i was on my way out why that's damn near treason don't be silly i had other important things to do in order to do them to continue work on the unified life theory it was necessary for me to contact scientists with whom professional relationships were made illegal by security regulations the choice was simple besides i didn't enjoy the idea of spending my life developing ways of destroying the very thing i wanted most to understand this is fantastic millet utterly fantastic but true none the less walker you look like you could use a drink by all means he stared emptily into the air thinking about the good old days walker a toast said millet holding a tall glass out to him to scientific freedom walker blinked by all means he repeated hoarsely and there was a blurriness to his vision to scientific freedom they drank and walker said i feel a bit freer to say what i have come for shoot nodded millet sipping his drink for security reasons i'll talk in generalities but the basic fact is united terra is faced with a serious situation it is most desirable that the research you were conducting when you left us be continued there are a lot of other capable physicists both eager to be a part of such activity and blessed with security clearances you know very well millet that this was an unique almost independent line of development that comes to a stop in your brain besides and suddenly he felt silly the lines of communication for research which might enable us to pick up where you left off in time too much time are somewhat entangled in security he glared don't laugh millet it's a fact of life which must be faced millet finished his drink and set the glass on an end table what you're doing is asking me to come back if you can arrange it walker spread his hands dr millet you have put it in a nutshell millet shook his head and for the first time since their conversation had started he frowned walker you know how i feel about developing weapons i'm just plain opposed to it the soldier is opposed to losing his life but many have to do just that in the interests of civilization that's serious eh walker crumpled under the weight of his fear that's serious he said wearily millet thoughtfully relit his pipe of course i'm not at all sure that united terra is very right in this thing in times like these that kind of thought is out of bounds 
snapped Walker. Whether you like it or not, you're a part of this culture. You might disapprove of many things in it, but you don't want to see it fall. Millet puffed gently. No, I suppose not. Again the frown flickered across his face. I've been very happy. I don't want my work interrupted. It is too important, Walker. Undoubtedly this would more than interrupt your work. It would replace it. Millet's eyes drifted affectionately about the room. Most unpleasant. A smile curled his lips. Frankly, though, I don't think you can clear me again. My problem. Indeed. A weary resignation seemed to settle over Millet, and Walker suddenly felt very miserable. I suppose I'll have to accept, Millet said pulling his pipe out of his mouth and staring unhappily at its trail of smoke. Walker put his hands flat on his desk and sighed deeply. Some of the pressure, at least, was off. He had managed to cancel part of the Confederation's advantage, Terran industrial strength and technological supremacy, coupled with Millet's genius, might yet equate, or at least circumvent, the frightful weapon the Confederation held. However, he still had to get Millet back into the government, though on the basis of the information he had gained regarding the scientist's motivations, and considering the critical nature of the situation, it shouldn't be too difficult. He clicked on his video and dialed a secret line into security data. Gyrating colors danced across the screen before it went black. He scowled, depressed the cancel button, and dialed again. This time the black was finally replaced by a recorded image, which said sweetly out of pouting red lips, This line is not cleared for the security information you seek. The problem you are handling should be routed through an individual permitted access to this information. The image faded into blackness, the soundtrack into static. Walker stared stupefied. No line, no contact. No source of information had been denied to him in over twelve years. His door swung open. He came to his feet abruptly, furious that someone should enter unannounced. He felt sickness strike him like a fist in the stomach. Merryweather, flanked by two security guards, pushed through the door. His voice slashed across the office like a broadsword. Walker, I'm shocked, shocked. And at a time like this, Walker pounded his desk. What the hell is going on? I can't get security data. You come marching in here with security men. What gives? Merriweather gestured to the guards, and they came forward, and each took one of Walker's arms. You're out of a job, Walker, snarled General Marcus Merriweather. In the name of God, why? You know very well. Take him to security detention, sergeant. And suddenly he knew. Merriweather stared indignantly when he started laughing. It was a hell of a thing to laugh at, but it was also the most hilarious tragedy he ever hoped to encounter. Millet, security risk, untouchable. Millet would finish his great unified theory and go down in history as neither Walker nor Merriweather, nor the genius who invented the Confederation's neural weapon would. Millet was as safe as he could possibly want to be. And so was the Interplanetary Confederation. End of the Security Risk by Ed M. Clinton, Jr. Read by Lars Rolander